Good morning or good afternoon and a warm welcome to all. You've joined the introduction session for module four, Managing Website Projects, in which you'll hear from museum professionals who have managed website projects through times of great change using teams of volunteers, in-house staff and community partners. Our truly amazing speakers will share information about projects that have been agile, effective, budget friendly and forward thinking. It's time to get inspired. This is the first session in module four of the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six US regional museum associations that is dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online trainings and resource toolkits focused on digital media and technology topics is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Zinnia Willits and I am the Executive Director of the Southeastern Museums Conference. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a light-skinned white female with shoulder-length reddish-brown hair. I'm wearing black rimmed glasses that are often referred to as cat eye style. And today I'm wearing a solid black sleeveless top and I'm sitting in front of a backdrop of a home office with a window and a set of white closet doors behind me. As the host for today's session, I would like to convey a few things to our attendees before we begin the program. First, in this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. Today, I'm speaking to you from Ocala, Florida, the historical homelands of the Timucua and Seminole peoples. Wherever we are, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project team, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society that perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of culture and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now for just a few housekeeping notes before we introduce today's presenters and get started. First, the best place to view this session in real time is on the Museum Learning Hub website under the Watch Live tab at museum-hub.org. Here you will be able to see all of the captioning, chat, and others' questions. I would also like to acknowledge today's American Sign Language interpreter who will be on the left side of your screen and let you know that captioning for today's program is embedded in a box just below the YouTube player on our website with controls to adjust your experience. The best way to continuously refine our programs at the Museum Learning Hub is to listen to our attendees, and we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Following today's program, you'll be sent a link to a satisfaction survey. Sharing your experience through this survey will only take a few minutes and will greatly improve our work. We encourage you to pose questions to our presenters, which will be addressed at the end of the program after the presentations. Please type your questions in the chat. A digital empowerment team member will be gathering them. We will get to as many questions as time allows. However, we may not be able to address all the questions during the live session, and other questions may arise after reflecting on a program. For this reason, we have, a set, we have set up an online community forum for raising questions, posting answers, and connecting with your fellow museum practitioners on the Museum Learning Hub website, which you can find also at museum-hub.org. If you are looking for help between programs, please visit this forum, create a login, and post your questions. A member of the community or one of our student technology fellows will get back to you. Finally, to stay connected with us and be aware of future programs, please follow us on social media. Links will be posted on the chat. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. First, we'll hear from Kathy Saunders. Kathy is the Lighting the Way Coordinator at the New Bedford Whaling Museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts. She has three decades of experience developing innovative programs with the Science Museum of Minnesota, Providence Children's Museum, 
Lippitt House Museum, and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. At the Whaling Museum, she coordinates Lighting the Way, Historic Women of the South Coast, which offers historic profiles housed on the project website, which are the inspiration for programming that explores and amplifies the impact of women from the region. Kathy earned her master's degree in museum education leadership from Bank Street College and currently serves on the New England Museum Association Board. Kathy will be followed by Dr. Fran Kaplan, a consultant for America's Black Holocaust Virtual Museum and co-founder of Nurturing Diversity Partners in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Dr. Kaplan's 55-year career has been spent working for social justice and peace locally, nationally, and internationally. She holds a doctorate in educational leadership and a master of social work degree. Her work as an adult educator, social worker, and community organizer has taken her into various arenas, including farm worker rights, women's health care, child ab abuse prevention, parenting education, and public history. From spring 2010 through summer 2017, Dr. Kaplan worked as a full-time volunteer with the community group working to reestablish America's Black Holocaust Museum. I have truly enjoyed getting to know both of these wonderful women, and I'm thankful for the time each has devoted to this session. Now I am pleased to turn the floor over to Kathy Saunders to begin our session. Thank you, Zinnia. Uh, I'm so glad to be uh, here. My name is Kathy Saunders. I'm the coordinator for the Lighting the Way project at New Bedford Whaling Museum, uh, Lighting the Way Historic Women of the South Coast. Um, so uh, just a little bit about New Bedford Whaling Museum to begin. Uh, we are located in southeastern Massachusetts on the traditional homelands of the Wampanoag people. Uh, the Whaling Museum is so much more than just the, the history of whaling. It is uh, a comprehensive museum of uh, history, culture, science, uh, and art. Uh, and it is uh, a mid-sized museum rather than a small museum. Uh, its budget is about $4 million uh, a year, and its uh, annual visitation is a little over 100,000 uh, visitors a year. However, this particular project started out uh, as uh, an independent project that then was uh, brought in under the wing of the Whaling Museum. I will be um, talking about that. So the original idea for Lighting the Way came from uh, a local woman leader who said, we need a coffee table book uh, to tell people um, about women's history and uh, all, all the women's stories who are untold. And as she started talking to other community leaders, it quickly became clear that the coffee table was really static uh, and that uh, would soon be out of date and didn't meet the needs. And so from there, it came up with the idea of we need to create a website and that will have longevity. And uh, so this started pulling together um, leaders from arts and culture, leader from history organizations. Uh, the, the, the original steering committee had, I think, over 40 organizations involved. Uh, and uh, the Whaling Museum, as one of those uh, partners involved, stepped forward and offered to be the fiscal agent. Uh, and then as the program became more established, uh, really took on the project and then decided to hire a part-time staff person uh, who is myself uh, to, to work with it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of uh, the project before my time and then dive into what the website looks like uh, and how we use it. So um, that initial uh, collaboration, um, they uh, launched the program uh, fully uh, in 2018, the summer of 2018. And they had a huge uh, uh, event with 600 people attended. There were costume interpreters. There were um, uh, guided uh, walking tours throughout downtown New Bedford, showing locations that women's stories were connected to. Uh, there was a printed trail map that was passed out and put out uh, throughout the downtown. Uh, and this was all to draw attention to the website, which uh, had these profiles of 
uh, uh, women that they'd started collecting stories of. Uh, so the website itself uh, is uh, on a WordPress platform. And uh, if you go back to the house in the WordPress platform, you'll see that these profiles actually are technically blog posts. Doesn't look like that to the user, but that's um, how the operational side of it works. This website uh, was developed. Uh, one of the community partners had a relationship with this uh, husband and wife design team. Uh, they were really supportive of the project. Uh, they designed the initial website. Uh, and really that core of it was that it was going to be these profiles. Uh, and that that because that was the core of the programming was how do we get the stories of uh, these women that so many people haven't heard of? Uh, because not only did we want to put women who may have been more well known, like Rosetta Douglas, who is the daughter of uh, Frederick Douglas, um, but we wanted to put people like Noli, the Goat Lady of Dartmouth, who had uh, recently passed away. Uh, the, these stories of community members that people uh, knew or had relatives or were connected to. Uh, so then, as uh, the website sort of got uh, sort of transferred into the Whaling Museum, uh, meant that then uh, the Whaling Museum webmaster, who was another part-time person at the museum, uh, was handling any of the updates that came along with it. So when I started the museum, uh, the website looked like this. Uh, it was uh, the home for these profiles, the one programmatic activity, uh, that was happening at the time was this idea of a walking trail. And they had that trail in the form of uh, a paper map that was uh, printed or downloaded in a PDF. Uh, they also had put those, uh, many of those profiles up on a mobile app. Uh, and then uh, they also occasionally offered uh, live guided tours. Now, when I was brought in in 2019, uh, there was a great desire to look ahead to 2020 and the centennial of women's suffrage. And wouldn't this be a great time to add on more substantial programming that uh, highlighted the importance of women's history and the women's right to vote in the election year? And I, the, the way I walked into it was I said, well, we really need to do some strategic visioning. Uh, and you know, if I'm going to know how to develop this program, I need a, I need to know what our vision is and what our values are, and how I can connect all the programming that has been tossed out into that uh, to help guide us. And that, in turn, guided uh, one of the first things I did, which was uh, went back to that original web designer and said, "We need our website uh, homepage to reflect our strategic vision." So. Uh, you'll see a couple of things that are changed here. Uh, one is that the core of the project is those profiles. So we wanted the profiles more prominent. Uh, we also wanted to really help people understand that this was live, that uh, profiles were being added, that uh, this was not a static project. And certainly it was a question I often got asked, which are the newest profiles? Who are the newest additions? So uh, this top bar here uh, scrolls through the uh, 10 most recent added profiles. And then there was a lot of programming uh, that uh, we wanted to do. And so we added these spotlights, these three spotlights, uh, basically buttons, uh, you know, icons and buttons uh, to link to the web pages with more descriptions to those. And uh, that allowed us to be current, dynamic, but also show the information in a very visual way. And in fact, um, I took this screenshot last week. And if you go uh, to our web page today, you'll see that this first button for Ignite has now been swapped out with our uh, guided walking tours for summer. So that allows us to keep an easy way to keep our homepage fresh and really reflect those programmatic goals. And that strategic vision helps me prioritize what we want to be highlighting at any given time. So what I'm going to do uh, is just share a couple of examples how we have used uh, the website to further our programmatic vision. 
uh, beyond just a uh, promotion of programs that we're doing, which we obviously do. If you go to our website, you can see uh, that part of it. But here are places where we've used our website in some interesting and creative ways uh, to help achieve our programmatic goals. Uh, so the first that I want to talk to you about, um, uh, well, I'll just very briefly, we use it to promote the walking trail, but I'm going to focus on the more interesting project. So we've got the Ignite uh, Youth Artist Showcase, uh, and that uh, was, uh, this is, a, I think we've done this for three years in a row now. We invite uh, young artists ages 12 to 22 to uh, look at our profiles to pick a woman that they're interested in and then develop an art piece that's inspired by one of them. So we're driving a younger audience uh, to engage with the content on our website. And then uh, we have this terrific website where we can then uh, showcase the work that they've uh, done. And we do this through, uh, we have uh, static images of the win winners. We have a slideshow of all the presentations. Uh, of all the art submissions. And then we also have uh, some videos of the, the showcase events uh, where the, we get to hear from the, the artists as well as see their artwork. So it's a way to really have it uh, live beyond that one-time event uh, that, that's held and to highlight these magnificent uh, young artists uh, and to make the profiles have a new life. Uh, also, during the pandemic, uh, we were able to connect the Youth Artist uh, Showcase on our website with the Whaling Museum's education site, uh, inviting uh, students to submit additional entries sort of during the off season of the contest. Another um, interesting project that we did uh, was a public art selection that also tied in a piece of online voting. Uh, we knew that in this centennial year that we wanted something big and visual and we weren't in a position to have a bronze statue built, uh, but we thought, wouldn't it be great if we hung a banner on the side of the Whaling Museum building that uh, featured one of our terrific uh, historic women. And, uh, but we didn't want to, we wanted to engage the community in this. So we decided uh, to invite uh, 10 young women, uh, and we gave them 10 of uh, the historic women who are all civically engaged. So again, connecting on the suffrage theme. And each of these women, uh, each of the, the young women chose one of the historic women and then did a short two minute uh, video profile of it. So again, how do you take what was a 300 to 500 word essay about uh, this woman put it into a new format that other people will engage with in a different way. Uh, tie in young people so that you're drawing uh, young people to the, the website. Uh, so then we did these videos, uploaded them on YouTube, and which then put them into a, a WordPress voting contest plugin and put them on our website. And then we did press releases, social media blast, and invited the community to vote. And you could go in and you could uh, like three of the videos at a time and come back the next day and like three more of the videos. Uh, so we got a bunch of names and of historic women uh, in front of people that they might not have ever known about, uh, engaged, uh, you know, because the students were involved, it meant, you know, their peers, their families uh, were getting connected. So it was really a great uh, way for that uh, kind of engagement. So uh, if you're interested in knowing what the plugin that we used, I put the link uh, right on the slide here so you can uh, see that. Uh, it was overall successful. I will say over the last weekend of voting when we were all off, uh, something went glitchy and people could start voting uh, multiple times in a day. And two of the women had over a thousand votes uh, each. And so we put two women on our banner. Uh, so it all worked out, uh, but you have to you have to monitor these things. We learned another uh, interesting thing we did was we uh, going into the fall election. Uh, we thought we wanted to do an election forum, and then we realized, oh, everybody is too zoomed out. They're not going to show up for it. But how can we really meet that mission that we have of making uh, women? 
uh, feel like they are seen and they have contributions to this community. Uh, and we thought, let's do a get out the vote campaign that features uh, local women uh, talking about why they vote to encourage other people to vote. Uh, so we had uh, women do these selfies like you see here. We also had uh, 14 short videos, uh, like 30 second longs of uh, encouraging people to vote. Uh, all of these, uh, every one of these drove people back to our website where we had put a comprehensive voter information page, which included not only how to register to vote, uh, how to find your polling place, uh, but also how to sign up to be a poll worker. And uh, those were put out on all our social media platforms and uh, was a great way, again, to sort of use our website as a platform uh, to help uh, en engage the community at this level. So the, the last uh, project that I wanna talk about um, in terms of what we've done uh, of sort of expanding the programmatic depth of our website is a digital exhibit we developed. So our profiles uh, as they exist now uh, are, as I said, 300 to 500 word essays. Um, and they're great, but they don't have a lot of context. And uh, in the year of the pandemic, uh, or at the height of the pandemic, when we were uh, doing so little uh, in-person activities at the museum, we were trying to think of ways to engage uh, with our audiences in different ways. And we were also uh, aware that we were going into a school year where Massachusetts teachers were now going to be required uh, to add in uh, a new civic engagement standards, particularly for the eighth grade. And so we thought, is there uh, an online, um, could we do a digital exhibit which connects with this idea of civic education that could help meet these standards uh, and that supports, um, uh, but then also uh, engages, you know, is an interesting, engaging platform and another dynamic way to engage with our content. So I connected with Road Tour, uh, which is a project of the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities the Brown University Public Humanities Program and the Rhode Island Historical Society. And they already have uh, a, a program called Road Tour, which is on uh, a website and a mobile app. It's on the CurateScape platform. And they have these uh, tours or digital exhibits on 35 different topics. And we said, what do you think about having us do one for uh, lighting the way. They love the idea. They they expand outside of Rhode Island into southeastern Mass. So we did this. As you can see uh, on the left hand side, there's a, a map of where it gets, you know, these, they're all place based. Uh, so you can see the, the places that we chose connecting with seven women's stories. Uh, and then on the right, I just took this screenshot to show an example of what we were able to do on this platform that is different from our website. We were able to uh, add videos and images that provide context to the story. Every one of the stories that we put on Road Tour on this Organizing New Bedford Women Who Mobilized Change digital exhibit, every one of the, the story pages has a link back to our website, both to the woman's pro profile, uh, but also back to these educator resources which support those civic education standards. And I will just say uh, that we launched that in February. Uh, the you know duration of visits on both their site and our site have been very positive, and uh, they reported to us that of their 35 tours uh, this spring, ours was ranked number four uh, on there. So we've been really pleased with the outcome of of this. So what's next for the Lighting the Way website? Well, uh, we want to augment the profiles uh, to be more engaging. We loved how Road Tour allowed more images, more context, so we want that. We also know that a lot of people don't realize that Lighting the Way is a project of New Bedford Whaling Museum, and New Bedford Whaling Museum has such amazing content in the archives, uh, currently digitized and stuff that also is not digitized in our collection. So this summer, I actually have an intern going through an inventorying 
uh, possible uh, pieces of our the Whaling Museum collection that would connect to the stories so that then we will then be adding uh, links and images uh, that enrich those stories. We also uh, we want to continue adding more profiles. When I came, there were 60 profiles on the website. There's 111 profiles right now. Uh, we have a list of another 30 names. Uh, people keep adding lists and we also are reaching out to other communities uh, where we have less representation, asking them to come forward uh, with new names of women that we don't know about. Uh, and that has also led us to be partnering in the fall with a University of Massachusetts Dartmouth class, uh, which is going to be doing research. And what I'm really excited about that is uh, most of our researchers and writers uh, who have been contributing are uh, of an older demographic, and this will be a younger demographic. Uh, they may find uh, stories uh, and new perspectives that we hadn't uh, considered before and haven't uh, been represented on our website. So we're very excited about that. So I just want to talk to you about a couple of, oops, let's see, my it's like, well, that was supposed to be a beautiful image of my logo on the left-hand side. So sorry about that. Um, just use your imagination there. Uh, but uh, so the challenges that I've found with this are lots of hands in the pot. So uh, there are times when I have to go back to that original designer when nobody on staff at the Whaling Museum can figure out uh, how to make a, a change. Uh, we also have had some transition in the Whaling Museum staff. So a lot of times I'm spending project management trying to figure out who knows how to do this that needs to be done on the website and when can it be done and how can I get in your schedule because this is not your priority. Uh, I've learned how to do some things, but there's other things where I'm like, I am not going to mess with that. So um, I think that's been a real, uh, you know, just a reality that I've had to face. Uh, the other thing is that when they started this, they didn't really know where they were going and they were just super excited and started throwing stuff up on the website. And um, as I learned where we were going and more about WordPress, I really had to do some restructuring. We had to completely, had an intern work with me to completely do the ta redo the tagging and the categorization. And we sort of changed the structure of the pull down menus, trying to anticipate you know, things that would be coming down the road. Uh, Again, you know, kind of that I always the New England house analogy. You start building and then you realize, hmm, really, we should have thought of putting the front door here instead. And then finally, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that uh, we had a mobile app uh, that uh, they, they launched at the same time as the website. And uh, it, uh, nobody used it. So uh, we discontinued it uh, at the time that we launched Road Tour because there we were. Uh, riding on uh, this bigger platform where we were getting seen rather than just sort of out solo on our own. And that is what I have to share with you today. I'll be happy to answer questions uh, at the end um, and feel free to email me and please do check out our website. And I am very excited for what uh, my colleague Fran is going to be sharing with you in a few moments. Kathy, um, I, I'm really uh, surprised at how many things our two museums have in common um, in, in listening to you. I found a lot of connections. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be asked to do this. I am with America's Black Holocaust Virtual Museum and also, as you heard, a co-founder of Notion Diversity Partners which is my full-time job, and the museum has been my full-time volunteer job for <clears throat> over 10 years, 11 years I think we're into now. Um, so I'll tell you more about that. But I want to just uh, tell you a couple of the things that <clears throat> I hope to cover in this 20 minutes. Um, I, I want to tell you what the initial inspiration for this virtual museum was and how America's Black Holocaust Museum went from a brick and mortar museum, which was had to be closed, to a virtual museum only, which took its place, to a museum beyond walls uh, that developed out of the virtual museum, and now back to a brick and mortar museum and still maintaining and growing the virtual museum. 
um, like to talk to you about how the virtual museum structures, uh, you know, structure evolved and how we think about curate and manage <clears throat> our virtual content, uh, which is about 3,300 pages right now um, and grows all the time. Uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the staffing and, and, you know, what it costs to do this, how we managed to build this over the next over the last 11 years as a volunteer project and kind of what it's cost. So, um, you know, I'm probably in a fairly different place in some ways than, than uh, many of you because this is not my salary gig and, um, and it, it hasn't been and it's really completely built or virtually completely built on volunteers. So, um, but you probably use a lot of volunteers, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit, just to give you an idea of how we use volunteers in the virtual space. And, um, you know, I, I, I think what I'm, one of the things that I'm proudest of is that I kind of anticipated, I'm, I'm an elder, those of you who can see me can see my white hair, uh, probably my wrinkles too. And, uh, People are surprised that I anticipated by over 10 years the shifts that organizations would have to make in this past year from bricks and mortar to, to virtual. But, you know, as I say, necessity is the mother of invention. So I hope to share some of the key learnings that I've uh, had over this time. Some of them may have to go into the Q&A, but uh, some of the things that we learned about are, you know, how to set the reading level and how to uh, field test that. Uh, the importance of, of visuals and what kind over time we learned about as, as the internet started to change. Um, how to do community um, engagement and programming in a museum that had no walls, or what we said beyond walls. Um, and uh, the interest internationally in this museum, which is uh, surprised me. Uh, I thought that race and racism were an American issue primarily, at least in the way that it's structured in the United States. But people all over the world visit this museum. Uh, some of our exhibits are published in France and Germany in books, uh, because it turns out that people are very interested in this. Uh, I was interested in Kathy's uh, unused mobile app because, of course, there's been a lot of talk for us about moving uh, to an even more mobile uh, situation uh, with the onset of the, or the, the comeback of the physical museum and how we integrate these two museums. So um, let me just give you a, a tour of the museum. Um, this is Dr. James Cameron on the left here, the founder of America's Black Holocaust Museum. Let me just say something about the title. A lot of times people just say the uh, American Black Holocaust Museum. This was Dr. Cameron's vision to help people understand what the Holocaust has been like that black people have experienced in the United States in particular. And he, his vision was to cover from captivity in Africa to the present day. And that's a pretty big scope. He founded this museum when he was 74 years old. I'm ashamed to say I've just gotten to 74 and I'm tired. But he lived to 92 and was working in the museum <clears throat> until then. Dr. Cameron is the only known survivor of a lynching in the United States of America. And uh, I think his conception for this museum was brilliant as a historical and memorial museum. Um, if you're not familiar with history museums that are also historical museums, I invite you to visit here and learn more about Dr. Cameron and what that uh, means for a museum. And uh, on the right hand side is our welcome video um, and the new building with Dr. Cameron's surviving son uh, in front of it. These are kind of some of the main uh, features of the museum. We have history galleries that are chronological as Dr. Cameron had them in his physical museum. And um, I will give you a, a quick tour of a couple of those. We have a memorial to the victims of lynching. This was, so far as I know, the uh, first memorial 
Oh, I'm sorry. I see it's hard to hear clearly. I'll try to. Do you need me to speak slower? Uh, interpreter? Maybe I'm going too fast. Uh, the first memorial to victims of lynching in the United States is now a wonderful physical memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. But we continue this memorial online. Uh, I will show you that. There is something you can do, which is to become a freedom lover on our freedom lovers roll call wall. If you'd like to take the pledge. If you want to understand what's meant by a black holocaust, uh, we encourage you to go read about it. And this, like, like some things that Kathy had, is a uh, constantly populating news coverage that we have. So um, when we first opened the virtual museum, the media called me and said, I understand you have breaking news. What's that doing in a history museum? And I said to them, well, it's history in the making. And the past is always with us. So um, this is one of the ways that volunteers help um the uh the museum is by uh posting the breaking news and i can talk to you more about that uh and it uh populates the most recent breaking news on the front page of, of our website we also have uh some other things that we uh can change we're developing a new gallery that's going to be a thematic gallery <clears throat> that will look at the black holocaust through the eyes of milwaukee wisconsin often considered the highest, the most segregated uh, community in the United States, the most segregated metropolitan area, which is where I live. <laughs> and so um, this is kind of the, the structure of the museum. I want to take you to our mission statement, ABHM, and this is a mission for both the physical and the virtual museums, which are obviously connected. The ABHM builds a public awareness of the harmful legacies of slavery and Jim Crow in America and promotes racial repair, reconciliation, and healing. Our vision, a society that remembers its past in order to shape a better future, a nation undivided by race where every person matters equally. And I'm going to start here by just showing you uh, a little bit about this history that you can read about. Um, and you know, bringing your attention to these navigational aids and the bar at the top, and also down the side. So we're in what we call a gallery called About ADHM, and these are all the things that you could do here. Uh, these are the things that you can find. We also have another way on all our pages to get from one gallery to another and to our special galleries. So you can get to the chronological galleries and our special exhibits through this. Um, there are, whoops, <laughs> sorry, light fingers on the trackpad here. Uh, Dr. Cameron was inspired by another museum that has now a lot of its exhibits online, but didn't at the time. Uh, because it was before the internet. He was in Israel in 1979 on a church trip and went to Yad Vashem, the memorial museum in Jerusalem to the Holocaust, and was inspired there to come home and start this museum by making collections in his basement study until his wife got tired of everybody traipsing through her living room in order to see his museum. And uh, so in 1988, he opened a physical museum separate from his home, which was unfortunately closed by the Great Depression in 2008 and by his passing in 2006, because he'd been one of the principal exhibits in the museum. He would talk to visitors and tell them the story of his lynching and how he managed to stay alive and what happened after that. Um, now you can read about that and see a video about that on our website. So these are some of the iterations of the museum. He started in uh, small storefronts. Then he got a whole building that the city gave to him for a dollar. And um, after he passed away and we had the inspiration to do a virtual museum, which uh, happened in 2010, kind of the end of 2010, 
the subversion and I were sitting around chatting and saying, how can we revive this museum without any money? And uh, I have a sister and brother-in-law that were very involved in web design. So I said to him, what about doing a website? I didn't know anything about doing a website. I had no idea what I was volunteering myself for um, at that time. But I also was unable to work because I had uh, gotten older and ageism came into play. Um, and uh, with my disability, I was unable to work. So I, uh, that is to make us, uh, you know, in a regular job. So I just made this my job and um, worked on this, as I said, from uh, the end of 2010 until today. And I'm still working with it. Some of the things that we did that were kind of beyond walls, uh, we also issued, reissued Dr. Cameron's um, memoir. Um, with some additions that he gave me that hadn't been in previous versions of the book. We also uh, had every year on his birthday a huge uh, celebration of some kind. In this particular one, we revived some lynching plays from uh, the early late 1800s and early 1900s uh, that were um, that brought out anti-lynching activists at the time. Uh, we uh, held uh, in other people's bricks and mortar spaces, like churches and libraries, we held um, interracial dialogues and so forth. So there was almost never a time when uh, America's Black Holocaust was not active, even though the physical space was closed. I want to just show you briefly, um, this is, an exhibit in our reconstruction gallery, a gallery which is fairly small still. Um, but as I say, this museum continues to grow. This gallery, or this exhibit, Founding the New Black Community, is part of our uh, telling of stories that don't get told often. Uh, and um, it's part of our, our themes, which are, um, which include resilience. And so we, we like to uh, have exhibits that show the resilience of the black community, even during the black Holocaust. And so um, this one was created by a scholar, Rio, who is uh, still a graduate student. We have both graduate students and uh, experienced scholars uh, alike contributing as volunteers. Um, up in their field that they, they work on. Uh, an exhibit by us is about 900 to 1,200 words. And we try to get it at the reading level of 8th to 10th grade, which is very, very hard if you ask scholars to write. So that requires some editing help. Um, because uh, middle school students use our website, high school students, uh, Americans whose first language, language is not English, people around the world. Um, so that's the reading level we try for. And this is one of the few digitized documents, historic documents that ABH owns. We do not have extensive physical collections and the ones that we do have are still locked in storage. There's no place to put them. But this one did get digitized and it's a marriage certificate because enslaved people couldn't marry. You can only imagine how once freedom came, how people, how excited people were to actually get formally married. Um, so we use, uh, you know, digitized information from elsewhere, obviously. Uh, we don't have all of it ourselves. Um, we use it under the, you know, public domain. Uh, most of our stuff because it's historical is in public domain and some things that are licensed as well. As I say, we like to tell stories that are not the ones that we all get taught. Well, I didn't get taught any of this in school in my era, but most people now get taught something about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and all of that. So in the civil rights movement area, we, we talk about Bayard Rustin, who was the architect really of the civil rights movement who was unknown because 
he was gay. And even uh, though he was the principal mover and shaker behind a great deal of the organized civil rights movement, he didn't make it into this picture of uh, the um, 1963 March on Washington. These are the leadership. Bayard Rustin was not in this picture because at that time, they thought that this would be reflect badly on the civil rights movement. And so we, um, we also try to tell stories that are uh, what we call intersectional. Um, and I just want to give you a, a sense of what the memorial is so to the victims of lynching. Um, we're trying to collect stories of lynching victims about their lives, not their deaths. We all know about their deaths. They, you know, lynching was uh, an abomination, an atrocity. And we do tell stories of lynchings here, including the one that Dr. Cameron uh, escaped. And, um, but we also like to tell stories of who and why uh, they were lynched. And in this case, we do have a pretty extensive story about Anthony Crawford because his granddaughter became a public historian, was able to uh, save, uh, you know, um, the story in her family. Many people, like people who have trauma everywhere, uh, don't want to talk about it. And so it is hard to collect these stories. A lot of people don't even know that these stories exist in their families. But we are starting to get more and more of that as people become aware. I thought I'd share with you the um, uh, the exhibit that's gotten the most comments. We do allow comments, and this one has 50, just a great deal more than most do. And it's quite curious because this is a breaking news story, actually, with something new that came up with Henry Louis Gates, famous historian, current, current contemporary historian. Uh, back in January of 1914, and people are still arguing about it. Um, and some of their arguments, unfortunately, get uh, into uncivil discourse, which is beyond our, um, <laughs> our comment policy. So what we do is, if we don't want to censor anything, we put it in an exhibit called Hateful Speech. So these are the, the vulgar and profane and whatever <laughs> um, comments that we didn't put in the other uh, uh, of the other uh, exhibit because uh, they comprise what we call hateful speech. I just want to take you briefly to breaking news. I know I'm about out of time here. Um, and as I said, this is uh, what we call history in the making. Uh, the most volunteers we've had I, I, I've lost count of the number of volunteers. That's probably well over 200 in the 11 years that we've been going. A lot of them are undergraduates uh, at universities around here, and they're mostly white undergraduates. So we call this our white students' educational, further educational program. People who um, do this posting for us read black media and black journalists uh, every week and put up what they uh, select. And of course, we give them some uh, some guidance in what they select um, and put up uh, breaking news for us. And uh, the really good students learn to connect this breaking news with uh, exhibits that are already in the museum. So we try to co connect the, the past and the present we use video, uh, we use, uh, as you can see, still pictures and things that are digitized. So here's an example about how you can learn more about the background of this subject um, in other places in the uh, virtual museum and all, all, also outside. So they learn to uh, aggregate these, to excerpt them, and to post them. And that's, that's a lot of our um, use of volunteers in addition to our scholar griots. Um, so uh, if you have questions after this, this is where you can find me. Um, and uh, I, I've given also, I think, uh, some links that you can follow. 
that may be in the chat later. Uh, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions. All right, we're all back. And I would just like to thank you both for those wonderful presentations. I will just tell everybody attending today that um, in preparation for this, this webinar and just getting to know Kathy and Doc, Dr. Kaplan, I spent a lot of time on these websites and they are uh, dynamic and deep and rich with such wonderful history. Um, so thank you both really for, for sharing this story with us. All right, we do have a bunch of questions and probably about five minutes. So I'm gonna try to get to about two or three, but don't worry everybody listening, we'll, we can follow this up in the, um, the forum that we have because obviously there's a lot of interest for both of you in what you're doing. Um, this one was particularly interesting to me as someone that comes from a collections background. Um, you know, you're both capturing stories of, of multiple, you know, Fran, 3,000 pages of um, content on your website. So someone wanted to know, do you have a database behind the scenes managing the profiles or are they captured posts or single pages on your site? Uh, like uh, so, with with lighting the way, the uh, as I said, the technically the profiles are blog posts, um, and so if I go back of house, I can you know search it by what date they were put up, what uh, uh, you know by what certain of their tags or keywords. Um, so that allows me to manage those. But then for the user, we've um, created some, uh, we've created a tag cloud, we've created uh, pull down menus of, you know, here by century, uh, by uh, what town they're connected with, or what key topic, like whaling or labor history. Or So I hope that answers the question for our site. Absolutely. Fran, how about you? Well, the breaking news is essentially uh, everything comes in to that post. Uh, we, we don't really operate much on a database except for the lynching memorial. Um, so because we wanted this to be something that could easily be changed, uh, not static. And let me tell you, one of the challenges of finding someone to do your website, we have found, is trying to get web designers to understand how not static museums are how they really need to be uh, very flexible uh, and adaptable to changes, as we all discovered even more so in this last year. Can I just add one thing, just in the, also in the back of house management, we just keep a Google spreadsheet that when someone writes a profile, they enter in the Google spreadsheet and then it's like tasked to the next person to review it and create the tags and to upload it. So that's how we keep track uh, behind the scenes of well, what's, what's in queue and what's moving. Okay, wonderful. Um, this one, well, and again, Fran, this one was specifically, did you say what uh, platform is your website? Uh, like Kathy, we're on web, uh, WordPress, which when we started was one of the few such platforms. Um, and we also knew that uh, it was easy to train other people on, because we knew that lots of different people who came and went semester by semester, we're going to have to be on it. And so we wanted it to be very simple to use and something people might be familiar with. Absolutely. Um, okay, here's a, another one that I'm sure lots of people out there will be interested in. What avenues have you explored for funding your website upgrades or features? Who wants to jump in on that one? I'm going to defer to you, uh, Fran, first. Well, we haven't had funding. Um, this has been a volunteer effort. When we, when we started it for the first 10 years, all the funding came out of my pocket. So things like web hosting, uh, the designer were mostly a volunteer, but we need to pay for some of their work. There's been a few things. Um, now, uh, there is some funding because of the, reestablishment of the physical museum. So this year, the physical museum gave me some money, a small budget to work with. Um, 
But I'd say that one of the places to go for us for this kind of funding in the future will be uh, the, um, the humanities funding, digital humanities funding, funding that every state, I think, has a, you know, a humanities council. And then, of course, National Endowment for the Humanities. So that's where we'll be going. IMLS. IMLS, until a year ago, did not define a museum as being digital. And now there's room for, for as we can, we all know, for digital uh, projects. But we, we, couldn't, we couldn't find a place to get funded as a grassroots organization for this initially. Yeah. Kathy? Um, I think I'll just add that we've, you know, any general funding uh, request that we've put in, whether to a corporation or a small foundation, uh, has, you know, incorporates the, you know, the prominence of the website and the costs. And so it's in a way we sort of say this is part of the overhead of the project. Um, but I don't, I can't think of funding that we've, we did not get a digital humanities grant, but that's actually because we're probably too large a museum because they were mm -hmm. focused all museums. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I think that definitely gives <clears throat> a lot of people some thought about where to go. So we are running low on time, but I'm, and I have one final question that I'll be interested to hear how you both answer it. Um, but then just everybody who's listening, some of these questions, um, Fran, there was even one about uh, what makes you know, a museum, a museum, if it's all on the website. So I think definitely there's room for conversation mm -hmm. here to continue on our forum. But the, the final question that I am going to pose to both of you, if you could start your website project over, what would you do differently? Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe just the one or two. <laughs> Anyone first? Well, I think one of the things just for me content wise is, um, you know, it was such a labor of enthusiasm putting it together, but I think we're recognizing that we want to create uh, some more standards around the profiles. Um, and, and so we're sort of building those out now uh, as we go forward. I think that's again the, yeah, what are your, What's your structure? What's your consistency across what you're doing? Yeah, I don't know, given when we started and how we had to start, what I would do differently. Um, what I would do differently now, uh, now, now there seems to be a real opening for digital humanities projects. And, uh, you know, if, if I could wave my magic wand, I would get somebody as a, you know, uh, fund developer who really knows how to access that, uh, because that's not really in my, uh, you know, ballpark so much. Um, because I do think that there's a lot of opportunity out here now that there hasn't been, thanks to the coronavirus. I mean, you, you know, it's one of the silver linings in the cloud is we've all, we may be zoomed out. But at least we all know how to use Zoom and we all know how to uh, engage the community in this way. And so there's, I think there's a lot more understanding of things that we could do. You know, if I had funding right now, I would do some GIS projects, uh, some other kinds of interactive stuff. One of the things we've long wanted to do is to gamify some of our history so that uh, people could interact with it as mm -hmm. a game. Yeah, and I just think personally, when I started, there was some assumption of like, oh, other people are going to handle the behind the scenes tech. And then in some ways, if I could go back and say, I would do an intensive learning of WordPress and what it can and can't do, um, that might have changed how I approach some things. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that time, take the time to learn, um, get, you know, that before you delve too deep can sometimes help. Well, and I will just add as someone who was thrown into managing a website with no experience of doing so, I, I completely um, understand and appreciate the reality that you're both putting to these projects and the, the passion behind it, though. That's, that's what's fueling it. Um, and one of my favorite aspects of this whole project is being able to give attention to these amazing 
um, sites and museums out there and putting real people to to the websites and, and real experiences. So um, I really wanna thank you both for your time today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and do my host duty and go ahead and, and wrap us up. So thank you. So for everybody listening, thank you all for attending today's inspiring session on managing website projects. And a huge thank you again to Kathy and Fran for sharing their journeys with website development, management and collaboration. So just a few super quick reminders. I know we're at time. Um, after each module or the full module each month, all four videos will be available on our website, um, as well as a complete toolkit of resources provided by our presenters. So there's, there's more to come. Um, also, please remember if you missed any of this session or just want to watch it again, as I said, you can access the recording on the Museum Learning Hub website. Again, that's museum-hub.org under the recent webinars tab. Um, please complete the post-event survey and feedback form. And then don't forget to visit that forum on our website um, to ask questions related to this presentation or additional uh, tech questions. So finally, please join us next Tuesday, July the 13th for the first technical training workshop for module, module four, which will focus on what you need to get started with a website project, including easy to follow step-by-step -step processes and helpful guides and checklists for goal setting, that's a good one, uh, project phases and team building. And this session will be taught by Despi Mays. She is the founder and lead strategist of Bluebird in Indianapolis, Indiana. So I've truly enjoyed being back as host for module four, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you all for attending today's session and have a fabulous day.